Colleagues, can I ask if you can mute your microphones, please, until you are called to speak by the chair? Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. He's not Vice Chairman until we appoint him, Mr Chairman. No, no indeed, all right. <laughs> OK, so I've sent us live uh, and there is a lag and I'm just going to check that the audio is running because there's been a Teams update. So when you hear an obnoxious feedback from my line, then you know that we're all good. Thank you very much. Yeah. OK, yeah. I can confirm that we're now live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, good evening, members and officers. And may I extend a very warm welcome to you to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee of South Cambridgeshire District Council being held on the 17th of December. Um, I'd like to, my name is Grenville Chamberlain and I am the chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. And just a few points of housekeeping before we start, if I may, please. Would you please make sure your device is fully charged or charging? Uh, please switch off your microphone unless I invite you to speak. And when you have finished speaking, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. And if you wish to speak on an item, please indicate this using the chat function, which the vice chairman, once we've elected one, uh, will be managing for me. Uh, but could I, before we just go on to the uh, roll call of checking members are present, extend a very, very warm welcome to the Chief Constable of Cambridgeshire Consta Constabulary, uh, Chief Constable Nick Dean. Uh, Chief Constable, you are extremely welcome and I'm most grateful to you uh, for giving up your time this evening to come and speak to us. That's no problem. Thank you, uh, Councillor. You're very welcome. Uh, members, can I just check uh, that you are present and may I call when I when I call out your names, would I ask you please to turn on your microphone and introduce yourself so that we may note your presence. And please remember to turn your microphone off after your introduction. Can I start with Councillor Anna Bradnam? Good evening, uh, everyone. I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, member for Milton and Waterbeach. Good evening, Anna. Councillor Martin Khan. Chair, I think Councillor Khan is still to join us. OK, we'll come back to that. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Uh, yes, Nigel Cathcart. Nigel Cathcart, member for Bastingbourne, um, and uh, I've been on the council for 30 years. Thank you very much. Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson. Hello, it's Sarah Chung Johnson, uh, one of the members for Longstanton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Graham Cohen. Uh, present member for uh, Fenditton and Fulbourne. Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, uh, good evening, um, Claire Daunton, one of the members for Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Councillor Douglas De Lacey. Good evening, Douglas De Lacey from Gerson Ward. Thank you. Councillor Peter Fain. Good evening, Peter Fain, representing Shelford Ward. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Joe Hales. Good evening, Chair. Councillor Joe Hales, Melbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Steve Hunt. Hello, Steve Hunt. I'm from Histon, Impington, Orchard Park and Kings Meadow. Councillor Ian Solom. Ian Solom from Harson and Combaton Ward, substituting for Councillor Jeff Harvey this evening. Thank you, Ian. And finally, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, Richard Williams, I'm the member for Whittleslip, Leplow, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you all very much indeed. We are all present and correct, with the exception of Councillor Harvey, uh, for whom Councillor Solomon is substituting. So, um, before we move into our formal business, uh, I'd like to invite the uh, Chief Constable to answer a number of questions which have already been uh, sent to him. I suspect that probably by the time we get to the end of these questions, there may well be some more. Uh, but I thought as the members of the public who are listening uh, may not be aware of what the questions that have been sent to the Chief Constable are, that I would read, I would read each of 
each of them out and enable the chief constable to answer. So question one, is how are we to meet the challenges of the rapidly growing new town of at Norstow already experiencing issues with antisocial behaviour with reductions in our local officers? Chief Constable, over to you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, this evening uh, and to try and answer some of the questions and I'll just caveat that if I don't, if I'm not able to answer any of the detail of the questions, then of course I'll assure you that you get your full responses uh, in due course. But in relation to the first question uh, around uh, North Stowe uh, experiencing antisocial behaviour and reductions in our local officers, well, first of all, uh, the whole of the county uh, and indeed South Cambridgeshire are covered by response officers who deal with uh, calls for service on a routine day-by-day uh, -day basis. And they are aptly supported by the neighbourhood policing uh, teams. And particularly with North Stowe, um, they are supported by two sergeants who two lead two neighbourhood teams out in that area of the county. Uh, one headed by Sergeant Rob Taylor and the other by Emma Hilston. And so the ASB in particular is, as with all antisocial behaviour, quality of life issues is really important to the organisation and indeed to partners. And we have a vibrant problem solving group within the South Cambridgeshire area, particularly uh, overseeing uh, the North Stowe, North Stowe development. So by doing that through the problem solving uh, group, not particularly in relation to being led by police, we are responding to the issues uh, of, uh, of the rapidly growing expansion, not just of North Stowe, but as we see the development right across the county. Uh, with reductions in local officers, just to answer that, you may and you, you probably have heard of the local policing changes which we've announced within the constabulary within the last few weeks and then confirmed up this week. I just want to give you assurance around neighbourhood policing because uh, certain elements of, of the media report, uh, uh, you know, and we, we do understand um, the, the headlines that that's, um, are published, but there is a vast amount of detail uh, within this uh, change programme that every neighbourhood would will get uh, a PCSO. Every neighbourhood has a quantity of police officers and it's well documented in terms of the investment that I have made in neighbourhood policing of warranted police officers. But just to reassure you and particularly in reference to the question around North Stowe, then we have done some detailed analysis in terms of the allocation of the PCSOs uh, in the future uh, in our neighbourhood structure. And that's based upon um, three criteria and an overarching parameter uh, that every neighbourhood will have a PCSO presence. And those three criteria relate to crime volume, crime harm, which is not necessarily the same as volume, and also a vulnerabilities location index which in uh, lay terms is around the vulnerability of a number of factors, including deprivation, etc., which, uh, which then we feed into a, an analytical model. And we can always crunch numbers and come up with a, with, with a number, but actually what's equally important is community feeling and in addition, the professional judgment of those people who lead those particular neighbourhood teams. So all of that is being fed into the mix in order to get the allocation out of not only warranted officers, but also PCSOs in the future. So directly answering the question, um, yes, we are aware of North Stoke in terms of local issues that are being experienced and raised to us. It has been flagged through the neighbourhood policing teams under the two sergeants and been uh, uh, discussed within the problem solving group going forward and will be. If it escalates, which I hope of course it won't or any other uh, issue, we do have neighbourhood support teams and other police assets who can go in there and do some more targeted work in partnership with other agencies and district council, etc., who can assist in that issue. Thank you very much. Uh, can I move on to question two? And that is, what impact will the reduction in, in funding for the Community Safety Partnership, I think this was part of the cuts, in communities like Longstones and Norstow, which have been identified as priority? OK, oh, just to clarify, I think with the question, uh, as part of the cuts that we've announced, the Community Safety Partnership is slightly different to Community Safety Officers. So Community Safety Officers are police staff employees within the organisation, and there are six officers who are allocated out to the districts across the county. 
um, is those that are um, a decision has been made to remove that role from the organisation. The assurance I give you is that uh, that work is fully mapped out of the uh, community safety officers and we are working through um, how that work can be reallocated without no loss of service within the community safety partnership. I made the real caveat on the local, you know, we go into the changes and the announcements that I've made. Of course, the impact of nearly 60 staff across the organisation will notoriously have some impact upon policing. No one can uh, withdraw, you know, I have to be honest, that no one can withdraw that amount of people without some impact. But actually, we're doing as much as we can to mitigate that um, impact upon communities on, on making people feel safe and on our crime and antisocial behaviour levels. So in relation to the reduction of the funding of those officers, we are doing our best to mitigate out the work that those uh, community safety officers do uh, within the organisation and then serving the partnerships and also importantly, our communities. In relation to safety community, sorry, community safety partnerships and the funding of that, and that comes under the Police and Crime Commissioner for the allocation out through the community safety partnership of those funds for the local CSPs. Uh, and they are clearly allocated out to generate problem solving tools and to Brazil uh, to uh, build resilient communities. And of course, include in the area in your first question around North Stone. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and this question refers to a press release which said uh, that you would guarantee a PCO in every neighbourhood. Um, what do you consider a neighbourhood and what size patch are those PCSOs likely to have to cover? OK, so um, we have 28 neighbourhoods covering the county uh, in, in totality. And when we split the neighbourhoods up, they are made up of a number of wards uh, dependent upon the location of that neighbourhood and the demand upon that neighbourhood is the number of wards which we feed into the neighbourhood geographic area. So really, you know, a neighbourhood, a, a, the size of a neighbourhood is really dependent upon demand, upon size, upon population. So there's not one size fits all in terms of the geography, the size, the population. But we do, as I say, then match the resource against not only the size of the population, but also the threat risk and harm, the crime volume, the crime uh, harm and the vulnerability of that location in order to put in uh, sufficient resources. And what's really important to uh, express is that although there are dedicated uh, officers and PCSOs for a particular geographic area, that does not mean to say we do not flex the rest of the organisation to a particular issue on a day to day basis through our tasking process. So the distribution of PCSOs in the, uh, the neighbourhoods across Histon, Camborne and Sawston at the moment are proposed as one PCSO for Histon, two for Camborne and one for Sawston, supported by a number of police warranted officers. And again, as I've said, the two sergeants of Rob Taylor and Emma Hilston. Thank you very much indeed. But the fourth question is, how frequently should any of our villages expect to see a police officer or PCSO on its streets in an average month? So I think this is a real tricky um, question to answer because there's no um, there's no direct science or maximum or minimum attendance that we would adhere to a village or a town or, or a street. Uh, when you look at the streets, um, individual streets across South Cambridgeshire in particular, there are over 2,600 individual streets within South Cambridgeshire. So in order to put a police presence on every street, I think you'll hopefully agree with me, that's, that's uh, considerably uh, un unrealistic for us. But just for sort of illustration purposes, if you talk about Melbourne population of around 4,400, then uh, during the month of November, they had around about 30 incidents during that month. And again, um, the, that's for response officers, additional attendance by neighbourhood police, uh, police team officers, uh, again, will support those, uh, support those calls for service. If you go to a small village or a small location such as, or a small demand area such as Littington, population of less than a thousand, three, only three calls for service were received 
uh, from that location during the month of no November. So consequently, the, dependent upon the demand, dependent upon the cause for service, dependent upon uh, the patrol areas, it really does uh, flex in terms of our policing presence. But I can reassure you and the communities who perhaps are listening online that through the analytical uh, expertise within uh, here at headquarters, then that monitoring of the demand through the demand hub, the control centre, the call centre, plus the analytical area will flex as issues are, 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 um, are flagged to us. And what's often the question, and you know, you have to put, you know, I put my hands up here, is often people phone in with information or intelligence and they feel, and there's a perception that it goes into a black hole and never heard of again. I can fully understand that. But actually what really is important is that does build the picture, even if we do not get back to that individual, uh, that where that demand is. So without the demand, without the cause for service, we cannot build up uh, a sort of expertise of the issues out in the neighbourhoods, which then feeds how many resources are allocated or where we would target patrols. So it is really important that people come forward, however they feel, uh, and we need to do better. You know, that's that's my honest opinion about about getting back to people. Um, that it's really important that people do report the issues through us so that we can apply some problem solving in partnership with others and we can then direct patrols to solve those issues. So not an easy question to answer in terms of, yeah. yes, you will get a PCSO or a police officer on a daily basis at this location. It really depends upon demand. It really depends on the workload of those officers uh, as they go about their day to day business. Thank you very much indeed. Very comprehensive. Uh, the next question is, we have many residents and parish councils who are unhappy with the changes you have made. Who should they contact to most effectively try to get these changes reconsidered or reversed? Well, I suppose we've moved on from um, whether these uh, decisions can be reversed or, um, but actually we're still open to the fact that, you know, we do, we have done um, uh, some consultation, some extensive consultation in relation to the changes. Um, that have been fed out over the over the last few months and certainly if I use and I know it's not um, you know not everyone's choice but when you look at social media uh, we've had over um, over 60,000 uh, posts put out ar around um, the, the neighbourhood changes and as well as contact with key stakeholders so the the decisions around the changes have been signed off by myself at what we term an executive board within the constabulary on monday it was presented to the police and crime commissioner uh, yesterday at business uh, coordination uh, group and they have been signed off to be implemented so those cuts uh, and those changes to our neighborhood policing will will be uh, going ahead and as i said and i've been you know honest those are not easy decisions to take by any chief constable. It certainly isn't easy for myself, particularly around my stance around neighbourhood policing. But actually the financial situation I find myself in, uh, and that's taken aside uh, COVID, is that I have to address and I have a duty, as you would well understand, to balance the books at the end of the day. So, but in answer to the question, if people want to contact us, then by all means contact uh, my office or the, the office of the Police and Crime Commissioner or their local neighbourhood teams to express that. We still have a, a comprehensive change team um, working on this change programme as the changes are implemented and views of the public are most welcome in order to uh, influence our thoughts. Thank you very much, that's very helpful. The next question is quite a long one, so please bear with me. What difference, if any, would it make to police resourcing if responsibility for parking enforcement in all or part of South Cambridgeshire were to be handled by civil enforcement as it is already in Cambridge City and on those parts of the park and ride sites which fall within South Cambridgeshire. There are parts of Orchard Park, Trumpington and no doubt other areas which currently fall outside civil enforcement because they are outside the city boundary and therefore the police are in theory responsible for parking enforcement. However, because people know that the police do not have the resources to do this effectively, it is reported that some people are parking illegally 
in those parts of Orchard Park and Trumpington which fall within South Cambridgeshire. Similarly, there are villages in South Cambridgeshire, including Great Shelford and Sawston, and no doubt others, where lack of resources for police enforcement, for example, parking on WLO lines, is a cause for some concern. This may become a bigger problem as new developments like Water Beach, North Stowe, and extensions to Camborne are developed. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, parking enforcement has been about as long as I've probably been in policing. Uh, and the um, the civil enforcement of parking uh, through, you know, wherever I, I have served has been a topic of debate. I think we really have to be realistic in terms of what the public would like myself as the chief and my officers and staff to concentrate on. And I fully accept, as I said, with antisocial behaviour, that some issues may not be top of the threat pile, but actually do cause um, concern in terms of quality of life. Uh, and there are certain issues which, are, as I've gone throughout my career in terms of community meetings, I, I could put on the top three. Parking is one of them, speeding is the other one, uh, of which an antisocial behaviour probably is the other one, of which are constantly raised. And I think in terms of speeding, um, uh, the various solutions that have been put in force and in terms of antisocial behaviour, I think we've moved a long way, not only as police, but as a partnership to tackle those quality of life and issues. But, but parking remains one of those thorny issues that fills many a mail bag, not only mine, I'm sure you as, as councillors as, as well. And I know it does in terms of the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. But I'd be, I'd be most welcome to enter into, as we have done uh, previously, into conversations about civil enforcement transferring to district councils. Because I, I do think there is a, an avenue there of which can be dealt with better than and more effectively uh, the, the constabulary who don't uh, understandably, uh, you know, and ultimately that, that's my decision about putting it high on the priority list. It, it may well affect, uh, if we got that right, our our, our respective mailbags. Uh, in terms of policing um, and the demand upon policing, it probably have little impact because, you know, of the priority uh, area that we concentrate on in resourcing this issue. Uh, but I do think um, I'd be most welcome to a conversation about if it's South Cambridgeshire, if it's in combination with districts right across the county, then I think there is a combination, there is a conversation to be had about how we pool our collective knowledge of those areas that have done it, those areas who think they can do it and want to do it, those areas who perhaps are reluctant because they think it might be a financial burden or it is not profitable, in, uh, profitable is the right word, uh, in order to do it. And I think there is a solution there. But it is a, it, it is a concern to members of the public. I accept that. Is it a priority of the police? I have to accept that it isn't, but I am I am willing to work as my officers are in combination with other partners in order to try and solve this problem through. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting response and I'm most grateful to you. Now, the next question, and you've touched on it, is what measures have been taken to combat the increase in speeding in the district during and following the lockdown? Yes, indeed. So, as I said, speeding is always uh, an issue which is raised in any community meeting. Um, and I, I caveat that from my knowledge as being a local beat officer um, at Down and Market many years ago when um, people came to me as the, the, the inspector there and pleaded with me to put uh, speed enforcement within the within the town of Down and Market and the surrounding villages. And when I went back three months later, most of them were up in arms because we prosecuted our own residents. So we um, we do have to take that caveat. But speeding is a concern. It is, you know, in all seriousness, uh, an issue for the community uh, in terms of, of, of where we are. We utilise the special constabulary, um, especially within the South Cams area, in order for speed enforcement. Uh, in particular areas of concern, again, where the data um, it, uh, makes a uh, good sense and prioritisation, road policing units and speed camera uh, vans. But also I, we can't forget the valuable work that um, Speedwatch do, uh, a system of volunteers right across the county 
coordinated by the camera safety partnership in combination with the office of the police and crime commissioner and we have an extensive network uh, of uh, speed watch volunteers and i think we're now getting uh, the coordination of those speed uh, watch volunteers uh, really uh, more right not more right uh, more correctly deployed in terms of where those problem areas are we uh, have, have seen a little bit of a dip in those volunteers naturally because of covid um, and we are once we are through into the new year hopefully uh, as the green shoots although today's news is not green shoots uh, around covid that we actually run another campaign to increase the number of volunteers that we could actively train uh, within villages to make that contribution to reduce down speeding we also have to bear in mind and this is no uh, detrigrade to the volunteers that come forward particularly with covid then they fall or some of them i have to be careful of my language some of them may fall within the vulnerable category and therefore we do have to pay you know cognizance to their health and safety quite rightly uh, in terms of being deployed out on the streets uh, uh, against the backdrop of the pandemic so we do use the special constabulary we do use volunteers we do use specialist assets such as road policing and the camera enforcement and again you know issues of speeding within villages is being fed within the camera the camera safety partnership uh, world and the uh, the the new scheme which has been launched through that 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 um, that multi-agency partnership so that we can direct resources into those hotspot areas Thank you very much, Chief Constable. I have to say we have a very effective and very active um, Speedwatch team here in Hardwick and they, they do a great job. Yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is how effective is the Rural Crime Action Team in working with local officers to combat rural crime? And could you provide some examples for our district? Yeah, I, I, I could in, indeed, Councillor. Uh, I'm really privileged um, uh, in terms of inheriting the Rural Crime Action Team, uh, because I think uh, they do a fantastic job. Um, are there enough of them? Of course, you know, no Chief Constable would say he's got enough resources in terms of putting them into rural crime in a county like us, but they are an effective team. Uh, in fact, only uh, last week, uh, myself and the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner held, and with the uh, Chief, Deputy Chief uh, Crown Prosecutor, held uh, an online conference such as uh, such as this with the rural community about how we could better utilize their eyes and ears their knowledge and the crown prosecutions uh, service and police and our cap were on that on that call and particular praise was given uh, to our cap in terms of their work they are extremely uh, extremely effective uh, they are deployed as a team of course they work shifts they have to have some downtime and when they are on they they operate as a team on a regular shift pattern or an, a regular shift pattern which is flexible dependent upon the need but there are days when the whole team are not on and that's simply because they operate most effectively when they're on as a complete team we have invested in terms of the you may have heard of the government uplift program so extra resource has been placed into the rural crime action team there is a PCSO within the Rural Crime Action Team and that post uh, will remain following the police changes that I've announced. And indeed, they've recruited a number of special constabulary members who are uh, equipped in terms of driving and got those specialisms to enhance their team. And I think uh, from memory, uh, Craig Flavel, who's the sergeant within the RCAT, gives me uh, uh, about three special constabulary members who are dedicated to that team. So there is never increasing presence of the RCAT across our rural communities. The question uh, also asked whether I could provide some instances uh, for, our, for our district. Well, yes, I can. I won't go into, there was an operation called Operation Chambers, um, which is a, a multi-agency day of action conducted across South Cambridgeshire on the 16th of October. There is extensive, um, extensive, uh, results within that which I could probably feed through to Victoria if that would help rather than just read out a list of successes but I will concentrate on one operation or perhaps two operations the first on the 17th of the 11th operations pinnacle which was a large-scale search warrant conducted in Meldrith uh, and that was based upon intelligence 
Uh, and despite the pandemic, we were able to mobilise a, a large number of officers over several days, uh, despite starting on the 17th of, it, uh, of November in relation to that. And what the Pacific results were around that were three stolen caravans recovered, two stolen trailers, one stolen transit van, five shotguns with ammunition, one rifle with ammunition, £140,000 worth in cash. One suspect has been charged and remanded for multiple firearms offences and possession of criminal property. And, and in relation to the 26th of November, following a tracker, uh, a location device on a vehicle activation on a stolen digger, which was uh, showing uh, stolen, showing on the Willingham area, the following items were also recovered. Again, the stolen digger from which the tracker device was activated, three stolen trailers, one stolen caravan, two stolen quad bikes, um, five cannabis factories, that was 77 plants in total, value of 66,000 pounds, and six suspects were arrested for a number of offences, including conspiracy to steal, cannabis production, a fray, and an assault on one of my officers. So they are very successful, and that just gives you a flavour of the Rural Crime Action Team, supported by the rest of my resources across the southern half of the county in terms of investigators, uh, which assist the RCAP in such complex investigations. That's extraordinary. Thank you very much. And the final prepared question that I have is what effect will the proposed reduction in PCSO numbers have on the overall strength of officers, both PCSO and regular officers, available for community policing in South Cambridgeshire? Would the rise of regular officer numbers over recent years leave us with a net gain in officer numbers, a fall, or will it be neutral against officer numbers back, say, in 2010? You are now you're now testing my mathematical skills, um, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, of which I am not at apt. I was never known for my maths. Um, but what I, what I can assure you, as I, I've assured you in terms of the cuts that have been announced, is that um, the allocation of PCSOs and police officers has been uh, worked out through professional judgment, through harm, through crime. Uh, through vulnerabilities uh, location and the feedback from communities and indeed the professional leads of the neighbourhood sergeants and inspectors across not just South Cams but across the across the county. Uh, and since I've been here, uh, then off the precept rise in 2018-19, I invested 50 additional officers within the uh, neighbourhood policing teams. And since 2000 and uh, to early 2017, the rise in neighbourhood, um, the rise in neighbourhood officers has increased from around uh, 57 to 132 at the end of March 2021. So that you know there is a considerable rise. Yes, we are going to reduce down our PCSO strength by 40. Um, some of that impact will be uh, on South Cambridgeshire in, in, a, in a minimal way, I have to say, in terms of numbers. Uh, but actually, I, I believe there will be a net gain. And in addition to that, as I say, it's not just about neighbourhood policing officers. It is about response officers. It is about investigators. And at the minute, I sit here and projected going forward with the highest number of warranted officers, Cambridgeshire, as known uh, it, it, for, for many of years, certainly before austerity kicked in in 2010. Uh, and we have uh, we are intelligently deploying those officers through the uplift program as they are recruited right across the county and into support services. So it is um, it is with some uh, I suppose relief as a chief constable I can recruit the police uplift program through the government of 20,000 officers over six years. We've already recruited our year one allocation. Uh, we will go into next year with our year two allocation, which has been announced today of an additional 58 officers uh, on top of normal recruitment. And again, they will be deployed ac across the county. Of course, it will take some time to recruit those officers. They don't uh, just, you know, some people think I, you know, not being flippant, I have a bottom drawer of police officers. I have to recruit them, I have to train them, and they have to, uh, you know, they have to get up to a certain speed before they are independent of a uh, patrol. But I can reassure you that we are invested across the organisation in warranted police officers, 
despite the unfortunate cuts that I've had to uh, make to, uh, this week announcements on police community support officers. Thank you very much, Chief. That, that's the end of the prepared questions I have. Uh, but I have another, a number of members who would like to ask questions. Are you able to stay with us for a short while to do to take them live? Uh, yeah, if I could just ask that I'd be released by about quarter past six, if that, that helps. I do have another meeting after this and um, I heard you on the introduction to say that Peter has moved to tier three um, is occupying mine and a number of other people's time uh, during today. So um, I think we're in, I'm in for a long day, but that's that's by the by. Yeah, thank you very much. In that case, the first question comes from Councillor Steve Hunt from Histon and Dimpington. Steve. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief Constable, for the uh, very useful information you've given us. Um, so my question is, uh, is this, our PCSOs, um, some of them have been in, in, in serving our areas for a considerable period, and they've built up a wealth of local knowledge, contacts, and they're known in the community. And what I want to know is, what can you do to ensure that as some of them move on and others are reallocated, that that local knowledge is not lost to us? Okay. There's two aspects to that, um, uh, Councillor Hunt. Is one we uh, we are as we say through the uplift program and through recruitment, uh, the option to transfer from being a police community support officer into being a PC, a police constable, is there on the table, uh, and we have, have mapped out the route for a police CSO to take through the selection process within the organisation to actually uh, go into formal training in May next year so that they are ensured continuous employment with the organisation. And what my commitment to the organisation, as I announced uh, this week, with as I address the PCSOs on my decision, is that if they do that transfer, and notoriously, of course, being PCSOs, they will come from community neighbourhood teams, my commitment would to be that they will be posted back within those community teams as warranted officers, because as you rightly say, they have a wealth of knowledge, they have a wealth of social contacts and local intelligence, and you know, to their credit, they have put in a vast amount of, of years and service in terms of serving the communities, so why would I withdraw them? And that will be in addition, uh, as additional uh, officers, to the numbers that I have proposed within neighbourhood teams. So it won't be that an officer is displaced because a PCSO who's transferred goes into the neighbourhood team. I've made the commitment that they will be in addition. So that's one way of, of retaining the knowledge within the organisation. And of course, what we've done on the build up to this uh, announcement is manage our vacancies within the organisation across the police staff establishment, such as within the demand hub, within the um, in investigative management unit, within the design out crime officers and all sorts of uh, avenues. Of course, it will no way um, cater for all the people who uh, I've unfortunately announced the cuts, but actually that, that they are available and because of the redundancy, because of the at risk process, they gain certain priority over being maintained within the organisation. So we are doing and we do recognise that and we mentioned the, the, uh, the community safety officers, the design out uh, crime officers which sit within the estates portfolio of the organisation, uh, then we are putting uh, a, a temporary fix in uh, to that to ensure that someone with the right skills and community safety officers have a wealth of skills within this organisation could well apply for those positions uh, going forward. So we, we are doing our best is uh, because I do recognise, you know, people have given a great deal of valuable service to the communities and to this organisation. And as I said, it was with great regret I had to announce the cuts, but I will do everything in my in, in my power to maintain their knowledge and connection with this organisation. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes from Councillor Brian Mills from Sawston. Brian is also a member of Cabinet. Brian. Thanks, Chair, uh, and thank you, Mr. Dean, for uh, coming and speaking with us uh, today. The um, question I was going to ask, I think you largely uh, addressed because you referenced the announcement today of £15 billion budget, which is uh, a significant increase. Um, 
you were saying that you've got your proportion of the 6,000 out of 20,000 recruitments of, of new officers. But I've got a question about the in relation to that, which is the amount of um, skill and experience that we've lost in the previous 10 years uh, and now having to recruit people um, anew uh, rather than having retained the officers that had the experience and uh, what what a comment from you on that would be useful and then just a, a little local issue um, what are the plans I think there are two stations including the one in Sauston that are effectively going to be closed permanently now and, and what you're likely to do with those uh, buildings as a, a, as a resource whether you're going to dispose them or not thank you okay um, thank you so in relation to uh, the loss of experience across the organisation I don't think that's uh, unique to Cambridgeshire that's that's across policing uh, since 2010 I think if we look into uh, figures quoted by the police federation and nationally I think there was about 20,000 uh, or near enough that since 2010 of police officers lost within policing. So that may well come from 20,000 uplift announced by the government, but I, I'm certainly not going to enter into any, any, any political debate. Uh, suffice to say that, you know, any increase in police warranted officers is most welcome. And I welcome my contribution, uh, my allocation of contribution from that 20,000. So just to give you a, a flavour, the first year of, of that uplift programme was 42 officers and we've we've recruited those officers 62 as I say for sorry uh, 58 for year two allocation for Cambridgeshire and then although it's not been announced we expect a further 82 for the year three allocation uh, to us but clearly that's a ministerial decision and that's subject to uh, any debate going forward but overall we have seen it we have seen an increase I do have um, a large proportion of my response officers um, of, of young in service and in experience. There is no doubt about that and I'm not alone that as a, as a chief constable. Um, I wouldn't like to quote a figure, but it, it's considerable. Uh, you know, I, if I said it was 50 percent, I'd probably it would probably be an underestimate of uh, response officers within their first four years of service. And of course, with that comes inexperienced supervision uh, and uh, and then we, we you know, that that often stems into or, or could could create issues in terms of resilience. So we, we can't stop officers leaving, you know, at the end of their 30 years, of course, they're entitled to leave at any stage, but particularly after giving 30 years law service to, to any organisation is, is sufficient within policing. But what I can say is that the the remodelling of the organisation, and this is not um, not in relation to cuts or additional, we've remodelled our existing resources, is to put in um, a continuous professional development unit, which are officers, experienced officers and an experienced sergeant. Uh, and if we talk particularly around, there's one in the north and one in the south, one at Thorpewood, one at, at Parkside, and they are assigned to each an individual shift. So not, not only assisting the inexperienced officers go, going through uh, their service, but also inexperienced supervision as well. And they've been in place probably since uh, mid September. And I have to say that has really paid dividends within the organisation already in terms of that support and guidance to frontline officers. What we've also created again within our resources are, are what are termed command cells is a bit of a policy term. But actually, they they uh, ensure the tasking uh, of the uh, of the neighbourhood teams, of the response teams, of the uh, as the, as the analysis of the information over the last 24 hours. Those in custody. There's a whole host of information, if you like, the brain of the of the of the South Cam's area as they as they churn information through on a daily basis to ensure we are deploying officers correctly. And they were born out of COVID. Uh, we put in two command cells to deal with COVID. They were so successful during COVID in the early parts of lockdown that we've actually put them into business as normal. So there is a there is a huge amount of work being done to support young officers. Uh, this afternoon, before officers pass out of Monkswood, which is our training centre after 20 weeks initial training, I spend an hour, an hour and a half with them to go through some reflections and expectations of them. I addressed 18 of those this afternoon and they pass out here at headquarters on Monday 
deployed across uh, the south and the north of the county. And I have to say, you know, when I look at the backgrounds of those officers, we are still got a huge amount of people interested in policing. I'm still interested, uh, very interested in people applying to Cambridgeshire and particularly from minority groups uh, in order to reflect the communities of which we serve right across the county. So I hope to give you that reassurance. We are aware of that issue. It's not alone to Cambridgeshire. We're trying to address it by support. We're trying to address it uh, by good supervision and extra training to those supervisors. In terms of police stations, I need to be really clear, we are not closing any police station at this present time. So police stations are not being closed and sold um, at this particular time. Um, Sawston will still be a police station with a neighbourhood team in. Uh, Camborne will still be a police station with the neighbourhood team in. And in addition at Camborne is the neighbourhood support team, uh, which is a considerable number of officers to deploy, yes, uh, across the whole of south of, of the Cambridgeshire, but they are actually physically located within uh, Camborne. Uh, and in addition, we we have, I hate to get uh, technical, but within the demand hub, within the control room, there is what's called an incident, respo uh, incident response team. A third of that team are being deployed out to rural police stations so that they can take appointments uh, for people to ring up, call up, make an appointment and then go to their nearest police station um, on, on an appointment basis, which is what we found more and more in terms of COVID that people want to turn up uh, on an appointment based as with many other organisations. The, the channel shift, the shift in communications within the organisation during COVID, as we have seen with many organisations, is certainly more online, is certainly more through web chats, through uh, online uh, calls, calls into the control room, rather than actually walking into police stations. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't say it's a, I wouldn't say it's a myth. Of course, it's a reassuring presence that we have a police station within a community, um, but actually the footfall within them is 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 really minimal. Thank you for your comprehensive reply. Appreciate that. Thank you. That was extremely detailed. Thank you very much. If we have time, I have three more questions for you, Chief. The first is from Councillor Anna Bradnam from Milton and Water Beach. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Chief Constable. Um, You'll be aware there are uh, the proposals for moving the police station from central Cambridge to a site uh, near the park and ride uh, to the west of Milton and including a new custody suite. And this is shortly to be coming to uh, a planning committee at South Cambridgeshire. Now, Milton residents are very concerned about the potential impact of the individuals being released from custody on the community of Milton and they are concerned about the potential for drug dealing, antisocial behaviour and theft uh, from residence, residences in Milton. So um, I wondered what action will you be taking to ensure the residents of Milton are not negatively impacted by the individuals being released from custody? And also, would you please consider um, putting a CCTV camera on the footbridge between the park and ride site and Milton over the A10, because that might um, help to mitigate the problems. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. The CCTV issue I know is uh, has been uh, raised before and I, I, I can't recall off the top of my head as I sit here today what the answer is, but I, I, I will look into that in terms of clarification of that issue. In terms of custody and in terms of a police station being based at Milton, um, I think we need to be reassured that police stations now, Parkside, Thorpewood, big police stations, from my experience in Norfolk, are actually located within communities now. And do I see drug dealing? Do I see antisocial behaviour? Do I see theft in the vicinity of those police stations now? Then no, I don't. And so why would it be transferred when we build a new police station in Milton? But I fully accept um, that uh, that is a community concern and whether it's a reality or not, that is a perception we need to work hard at. Mm. The, uh, you know, if I speak from personal experience, I'm not sure, uh, Councillor Bradnam, whether you were at the, con I think you, you were and I've spoken before, is that when I was in Norfolk for a period of time, I lived on an estate next to a police investigation centre, a custody centre in Norfolk, uh, in Wyndham. 
And again, a community concerns there were raised around the impact of that custody. I indeed lived on that estate uh, and there was no impact at all. You, you will see a bigger police presence within Milton, which should be reassuring. The custody provision is that um, there is risk assessments around all people taken into custody and all people uh, who are released from custody. And those most at harm or risk of harm or serious offences, um, if they are so subject to remand in custody and they need to go before a magistrate, will either be video conferenced into the court from the custody centre or actually transported by private security uh, to the court cells themselves. And before anybody is released, there is a risk assessment. And if I base upon my experience in Norfolk, then that, that is, a, uh, and in, in Cambridgeshire, is that, that is a legal requirement in terms of risk assessment of people being released. The vast majority of people, if not all the people who are subject to either mental health or they're juveniles or they are subject to vulnerability, are released in the, in the company of an appropriate adult, their parent, their guardian, or indeed their legal representative. So, I, I, I do get the concerns, but actually we have we have police stations now within communities. And do we see when we you know we release people from Parkside in the centre of Cambridge with all those uh, terraced houses and communities in the centre of that city? Uh, and do I see theft and uh, theft and criminal damage and vehicles and burglaries being committed by people being released in the heart of the city? Uh, no, I don't. And so I do not expect that to be the case in Milton. There, there were some concerns, certainly where I lived, that oh, well, people won't be able to get back to Norwich if they lived, uh, lived from Wyndham, some 12 miles away. Therefore, they will be stealing local vehicles. Um, that didn't happen and still doesn't happen to this day. So I, I think you can be reassured that we will, we, will, um, we will clearly monitor the situation because we don't want crime happening in Milton as we do in any other part of the location. Um, but in, in terms of those concerns, please be reassured it is, in, it is within our sights. I should say there are some local farmers who would like to have your police station right in the middle of their farmyard, actually. So. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> Chief Constable, you will be, I'm sure, delighted to know that due, owing to the complexity and the detail in your answers, you have already answered the remaining two questions that I had. So, OK. Could I, on behalf of us all, uh, extend to you our most sincere gratitude for the time you have taken and for the detail that you have delivered in your responses this evening? I think I probably speak for us all when I see the nodding heads uh, that we are all in extremely grateful and uh, most appreciative of not only the work that you do, but your officers too. And may I, on behalf of us, wish you, your families and your teams all the very best for Christmas and uh, happy and crime free 2021. That's thank very you kind. so much. Uh, that's very kind. And, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. And that, you know, the invite, you know, uh, I wouldn't say on a regular basis, but if you wish me to come back at, at some point, then the offer is there, uh, Councillor Chamberlain, and I'd be more than willing to do that. So thank you. And again, my season's greeting. I hope you have a safe uh, Christmas. I'm not sure about a, a crime free right across the county but if I could wish you a safe Christmas uh, then uh, thank you and I will relay that message back to my organisation so thank you very much for your time. Thank you all the very thank best you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome if you wish to stay Chief Constable listen to the rest of it but I bet you got, bet you got a better offer. Ladies and gentlemen I hope you found that as interesting and as enlightening as I did and of course, the uh, question, if there are any further questions, um, then the Chief Constable did indicate that there are ways and means that we could um, ask those questions through his organisation. But could we move now? To, uh, does anyone have any comments? Is everyone content with that? Is that something that you would like to consider, like us to do again? Perhaps once a year we invite the Chief Constable? I and think that would be an excellent idea, Chairman. I think it was extremely valuable. Yeah, agreed. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Uh, item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. So, Victoria, can you uh, bring us up to speed with 
Apologies, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, we've received apologies for absence from councillors Jeff Harvey and Judith Ripith, and councillor Ian Solemn is substituting for councillor Harvey. Thank you very much. Um, as councillor Ripith is not able to join us this evening, and I do hope that all is well with the family, um, I have had a volunteer, Joe jo Hales, has offered to uh, act as vice chairman for this evening. Uh, is anyone opposed to that? No. Thank you very much, Joe. So you have a job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, agenda, agenda item two is declarations of interest. So may I ask, do any committee committee members have any interest that they would like to declare in relation to any item on the agenda? Um, Chairman, do those of us who are on the planning committee need to indicate that? I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I think that's entirely in order. Uh, item three on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. And can I just say from the outset that Councillor Richard Williams has notified us that he was indeed present at the last meeting, but does not appear on the list of attendees. And subject to this being corrected, are members happy to approve the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 12th of November 2020, or are there any matters of accuracy that members would like to raise? I'm happy with the minutes. Thank you. Chair, Sarah. sorry, it's Sarah. Yeah, I have something. Um, where it says the chair of the scrutiny task and finish group looking at equality and diversity issues, um, could we change this to anti-racism? Because I don't want it to make it look like we are looking across all of equality and diversity because our, our, um, uh, our, our remit is a lot loud lot narrower than that. I guess that's more of a matters arising than a, was that the minutes were correct at the time, were they not? And we should therefore change the title of it through the process of, of the meeting. Is everyone happy that we change the minutes? I'm, I'm happy and I can, can Councillor Chung Johnson advise us whether she made that point at the time? I don't recall. Of, of the meeting. Um, the, the task and finish group has never covered equality and diversity. No. For the whole oh, okay. of equality and diversity. So it's just so it's just more clarifying that we aren't. Okay. So it's across that remit. A mistake. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm, so, so it's just there a work in minutes yeah. rather yeah. than. Yeah. Okay. So subject to that amendment and Councillor Richard Williams being added, is everyone content with the minutes? And I shall sign them off at some appropriate time. Agreed. Great. Thank you all very much. Uh, agenda item four is public questions, uh, but I can tell you that we have, well, we hadn't as of this afternoon received any questions, so I presume that's still the case. Uh, agenda item five, I believe that we have now dealt with with the uh, Chief Constable and his ex extensive um, information that he's delivered this evening. It really is, I think, extraordinary. So we come to item six, which is the uh, Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service Delivery Update. And I'd like to call on the lead cabinet member for planning, Councillor Tumi Hawkins, to present the report. Although I believe that Stephen Kelly and Sharon Brown will also be present to support uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Good evening, members of the committee. Um, the last time we were before you in July, um, we went through where we were at and we said we would bring back to you an update report uh, later on in the year. And this is the uh, this is the report. Um, we have uh, come some way um, from where we were then. And um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of positives that we can draw from uh, from the work that's been done uh, in that time. Um, as you know, we've implemented the, uh, the three area teams in uh, development management. And um, uh, some of the performance issues uh, that, or performance um, enhancing uh, things that we've done is to actually now we've created um, 
a way in which we provide weekly reports uh, to parishes and members, and I hope members actually have uh, found that very useful. Um, and also, um, we have created a new online customer feedback questionnaire, um, you know, for for our customers. Now, uh, we've got you know onboarding process uh, when we recruit new uh, new um, staff, and um, also we're now uh, developing a new single customer complaints process. Whereas before in the service we had one from the city and one from. Uh, for South Camps. Um, now, some of the work that has also been done include, um, you know, updating our pre-application charges, and um, because again we had two charges from South Camps and um, City as legacy. Uh, in addition to that, we've actually now created a new and improved pre-app service, uh, which which we have launched, and um, you know we're hoping that many more applicants will actually use that process because what we what we realize is that if we have an upfront um, service that they can uh, use that gives them um, you know the right information so that they can create and present to us a proper application then of course the application can go through the uh, the system uh, much easier for all of us um, i mean details of that obviously um, you know we, we we've published and also in terms of uh, customer service, we have rolled out what we call a 24 hour callback service, um, you know, so that uh, officers can respond back to um, um, uh, those who uh, request for updates and, uh, and are chasing. But we hope that as they get used to the uh, customer service interface and we, we provide more information on that, they can use that to actually get the updates that they require um, on their applications. We've also introduced a standard planning performance ag uh, agreement uh, template, which we'll use for you know, some of our bigger applications. And um, also for members, we have introduced uh, more member development training, uh, which happens uh, at the beginning or you know, prior to um, planning uh, committee meetings starting. And these are kind of bite sized training sessions which also I hope members have found to be quite uh, quite useful. And um, we're working on a single suit of planning conditions for uh, applications, which again should help us with uh, with sending out notices um, after applications have been determined. And um, we spoke about the plan advisory service uh, reviewing the committees. Uh, this has taken place. And um, the report for that will be published uh, early in the new year. Um, there's a lot more that I could be talking about, um, but I know that there's a, a lot of questions that people would want to ask, um, including perhaps uh, an update on the, on TerraQuest. We have had uh, help uh, from from that contract. That contract was only actually just signed up um, earlier on this year. Um, but we've been able to use them uh, in DM as well as to clear the backlog of validation um, uh, applications that we had. So um, I think I will at this point. You've gone mute. I don't know why that happened. I think I must have lost something. Um, if I may at this point, um, ask if Sharon, uh, Sharon Brown or Stephen Kelly might want to add to that because I know, you know, they have a more operational overview of what's been going on. Sharon, are you going to come in at this point? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to do so. Um, I won't reiterate the issues that Councillor Hawkins has already highlighted, but I do want to mention a few other highlights um, over the from the last 12 months. So in particular, I would like to highlight the ICT upgrade that has taken place, the migration from the South Cam's APAS system, the introduction of an upgraded uniform system and the migration of the system onto a new server system to create a more robust basis for the system. So um, that obviously has taken a significant amount of officer time into that. 
and there's been a, um, high volumes of testing work that's also been associated with that and data that's been transferred. Uh, so that's those are areas that we've been dealing with throughout the year. Um, I'd also like to highlight the reduction in the number of complaints uh, and the comparison in Appendix B compared to um, last year. Other areas of the service where I think there's been significant progress include the strategic sites team and the uh, outcomes on strategic sites, which are set out uh, in paragraph 30 of the report. And I'd just like to update that today, uh, this week, we have completed the Section 106 agreement for the Welcome Trust application and also the land north of Cherry Hinton applications and the planning permissions, both of those being issued this week. Um, I think in relation to the, um, the three geographical areas, it's important to highlight the work that the team leaders and their teams have been doing in terms of seeking to improve relationships with the parishes mm. and with local communities and a number of walking tours that have been held by their team leaders and the parish meetings that have taken place. Uh, we will have a programme of area parish meetings uh, into next year. So we are proposing to have quarterly based area uh, meetings with the team leaders and we're currently putting together a programme for that. Um, in terms of our performance, um, it has improved in terms of comparison with previous years, and you can see that from Appendix A. Um, obviously, it does rely on extensions of time, and uh, we do need to do some work in terms of improving our uh, reliance on extensions of time and reducing those. That's work in progress, and I think in this respect, we are consistent with a lot of other authorities. So um, extensions of time are used extensively um, across the country by other planning authorities. So I think just to say that, um, just want to highlight a number of positive outcomes, but recognising that there is still a lot of work to do. We have a programme of further improvements, which we'll be doing uh, throughout next year. We are looking at uh, various systems and processes within development management and enforcement. Uh, so there's a there will be a structured improvement program ongoing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, Stephen, did you wish to say anything? I, I don't think so at, at this stage. I suspect there's going to be some questions that members will will have, um, and I'll. I'll uh, I'll pick up I, th I think a couple of the matters that they might want to discuss perhaps in the answers. Thank you very much. You you may rest assured there are some questions, and I think the first is from uh, Councillor Daunton. Claire. Councillor Daunton. Yes, you... thank you. Um, I I, I thought that uh, Councillor Chung Johnson was before me. I think that no, was a okay. previous section. Um, right, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Chamberlain. Um, so I have two questions. Um, I'll take the second one first now, Sharon, because you've just mentioned that, and that's to do with the area teams. Um, so um, you, it meant in the report you mentioned that there's some um, evening out of work, and I think that's uh, uh, really necessary, and so I wondered how long that will take. Um, and related to that, um, also, when you have the meetings with the parishes, um, could uh, members be alerted to the fact that those meetings are happening and possibly also be invited? So those are my pair of questions on area teams. And then a, more, a much more general question. It's now four years, I think, since the um, decision to merge the two uh, planning departments. Do you think that that merger is now complete or is there any big piece of work that still needs to be done to bring the merger to a completion? Councillor Hawkins, you're mute. Um, 
Right, uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the uh, area teams, uh, yes, I mean, the, 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 the reason for creating them that way was to try and um, improve on the relationships with parish councils. And for sure, uh, when the meetings take place, uh, we can and um, we will look into making sure that we actually let the uh, local members know so you know exactly what you know <laughs> when it is and what is going on and uh, so that you also can receive uh, the same information. Um, in terms of the the mergers of the two um, uh, planning services, uh, the major work has been done. Um, the staff were tupid over in May of, no, I beg your pardon, April of 2018. And um, the area teams uh, creation, which we went through and implemented early on in the year, um, I think was the probably the last step in the actual merger. What we're now doing is actually working on our processes to bring those in line and the, the you know, merging two services, you had two legacy, uh, two legacy processes, and we're now working through those now. I don't know where that's coming from, but can I ask you to please mute your microphones? Sorry, Councillor, please, please carry on. Ca um, yes. Councillor, sorry, Chairman, I think it might be Councillor Cascart's microphone if he could mute himself i think that might help um, yeah thank you Anna. councillor hawkins please carry on thank you um so we are going through something else i wonder if it's me Uh, we are going through now um, the process of aligning um, the legacy uh, legacy processes that we have. Uh, I mentioned previously, you know, the PPA, uh, um, and uh, you know, we've done we've done that for validation, for example, and uh, you know the process of actually um, implementing a uh, decision. Um, there might be some others that I'm not aware of at this point in time. Uh, perhaps Sharon can help with that. Yes, Chair, if you're happy for me to, to just uh, amplify that. Um, so there are a number of processes um, that need to be updated and aligned. Um, and that's one of the complications of being a shared services that we also uh, have various activities where we support some services uh, outside the shared service and need to work with other services to map out those processes. So if I took tree applications for an example, so the South Cam's tree offices are within the planning service. The city tree offices are within a different city council service. Both tree teams worked in quite different ways. So one of the um, uh, processes we will be looking at uh, into next year is aligning the tree application process and working with the officers in both those teams to have a single process. So that's one of those examples. Um, we'll also be looking at um, areas such as the appeals processing, uh, the way that we uh, process appeals. Uh, one of the um, areas that we have got an aligned process on now is discharges of conditions. So that's an area that we've done some work on, but there's some further work to do on that um, in terms of streamlining that process. So we obviously want to make a lot of our applications processes as efficient and as speedy as possible. And I think there's there's still quite a bit of work to do in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daunton, did you wish to come back on that? Um, no, I don't. That was a, a very good answer. And I yeah. realised just how complicated it is to bring all those aspects together. Thank you. Extremely complex. Thank you very much. Councillor Cohn. Thanks very much, Chairman. So firstly, um, thank you to the League member and the officers for putting the report together. It's you know, a good overview as to where, where we're at and there's a lot of information in there. Um, I've got a few questions. The first one is just a, a quick one, really. 
um, about uh, TerraQuest and the um, how long we intend to sort of continue using that service. Um, the the second one was um, around sort of staffing and um, have, have we got figures um, as to, to where the, those staff are going to? Is that, you know, are they moving to the private sector? Are they going to other councils, staying in the public sector? Um, and it alludes in, in paragraph 37 about, you know, staff surveys. Have we got that information through yet for you to update us on? And, you know, why are we waiting until January for the recruitment process to, to take place? Why, why hasn't that started? Um, for the enforcement officers and then very briefly on page 20 and um, where we talk about um, the um, extensions for applications is it possible to break that data down at all so we can see who has requested that extension because in some cases it might be us and in some cases it might be the applicant so if we had an, an idea of that um, you know, it might sort of uh, help us look when looking at the figures thanks very much Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, right, I think the first was, was on TerraQuest. Um, initially, we had three uh, members of staff from TerraQuest who were working for us uh, on a part time basis. Um, but now uh, that has whittled down to one TerraQuest uh, staff working for us full time uh, in DM. And then uh, earlier on in the year, we took on three additional to help us with uh, the validation uh, of applications. And actually it was with their help that we had, we were able to actually bring down um, the, the backlog of validation applications that we had. And now we've got, they've gone down from three uh, to two. And the staff are now working, now that we've got the backlog out of the way, they're now working towards making sure that validation is done within the five day time frame uh, that we're aiming for. Um, so in terms of staff leaving, I believe that those who have left other than one have been contract staff. As you know, we've got vacancies within the service that we've been filling with contract staff. And, you know, sometimes their contract comes to an end, they go somewhere else. I don't know where they go. Perhaps, um, you know, I'm not sure that we do HR, um, the HR process for them because their contract, we might. I don't know about that one. I can double check. Um, and the one that was uh, a full time staff was from the TSO team. Um, and again, it's I don't know where they have gone. Um, in terms of the breakdown that you're asking for, this is the table B, is that right? On page 20. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. So uh, yeah, page 20, um, sort of, yeah, ta table B, where we talk about um, the extension times, you know, ca can we get a breakdown of figures to say, or is it us requesting an extension, or it could be the applicant requesting an extension, you know, on the flip side of that. Right, okay. Um, I will need to defer to Sharon to find out how easy that will be to do with the database that we've got. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the majority of instances, I mean, it's normally, I mean, the applicant would be asking for the extensions of time because it would be the applicant who would be seeking uh, to amend an application. And then that is why there would be a discussion about requiring an extension of time. So if we receive an application and it's unacceptable as it stands, it requires modifications to address uh, consulty responses um, or comments from local community and parish councils, then we would uh, uh, request um, an extension of time if the applicant were willing to amend that application because um, we have a very high proportion of approvals across the board. So we approve the majority of planning applications. We've got, um, so for example, in, in recent months, we've been approving 100% of business applications, um, something like 80 plus percent of householder applications. You wouldn't be able to do that 
um, unless we were able to amend the application in many cases. In most cases, it's a discussion between the uh, case officer and the applicant, but the applicant would be wanting the extension of time to allow them to amend the application rather than having a refuse and difficult to to provide it in the, in the way that you're asking, Councillor Cohn, because there's a mutual discussion and it's in the interests of the applicant normally uh, to, to request that extension of time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Are you content with that, Councillor Cohn? Thanks very much for that. Yeah, very content. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Martin Khan. Martin. <coughs> Hello, yes, uh, it's very comprehensive uh, supply uh, report, annual report about the situation, uh, but it taught, it's um, done internally about the main uh, issues of practical management. One of the big issues that's last coming this year has been the problem with par parish councils and the extent to which we have to bring to committee uh, place, um, count applications where the committee, uh, where the um, parish councils object and whether uh, and how the delegation process works. If uh, we're waiting for the planning advisory service report, which will no doubt make a recommendation on, on this, but if it turns out that we have to consider the far larger number of applications um, uh, in the light of the response we get, how will you be able to manage uh, with a larger number of applications uh, uh, going, to, go, going to committee? Is that going to create a problem? Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as I said, Previously, we, we will be publishing, we have the report, but we'll be publishing it, uh, making it public in the first week of January. We, there are recommendations that we expect, um, you know, will be with the report. And one of the things that we wanted to talk to you today about was to support the creation of um, uh, like a task and finish group that will look into implementing those recommendations. What we don't know yet is uh you know the the extent to which the 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 changes that you have referred to um will affect the committee but the my my feeling is that once we are able to look at the recommendations in full uh and start um considering them we might be able to give you a fuller answer because obviously you know we have to look at the way the whole process works you know how many is, uh, is requested to go to committee, the criteria, uh, how many of those actually meet the criteria, because uh, there, there is a set of criteria that uh, the requests have to meet. And obviously, you know, things like how long the meetings take, um, all of this will, will need to look into that as part of implementing the recommendations uh, that come with the report. So I'm happy to come back to you uh, further down the line um, to give you a full answer on that. Chair, can I, yes, can, can I just comment a bit further on, on, on that on that point? Um, uh, obviously, the, we, we've asked PAS to, to look at it, uh, Councillor Khan, as, uh, as you know, and, and as Toomey highlights, they'll bring, bring in a report. But actually, um, in response to the initial concerns that were expressed earlier in this year uh, and the changes that we've made, we have um, actually revised the, uh, and, and put a more um, transparent process in place that I think initial feedback that we've had suggests the parishes are at least recognising has moved uh, things forwards. Um, and just um, to offer some reassurance, I think one of the concerns was that an awful lot of parish requests were being declined to refer applications to committee. Um, uh, both the chair of, of planning and my officers and myself have taken that concern on board. And in fact, since the introduction of the new arrangements, um, something like 22% of all requests have res resulted in um, so one in four almost of applications that are called in uh, are being reported to committee uh, and people are getting much more comprehensive explanations um, around those that are not uh, precisely because we're trying to respond to to those concerns and, and um, I don't have the figure in front of me for the circumstances before we undertook that um, internal review, notwithstanding the past review, but I understand that the concern was the figures were around one or two percent of applications were only uh, being referred. So we have listened, uh, we sought to respond uh, and um, the feedback at the moment, clearly not every application that's called in may be appropriate for committee um, uh, and there are impacts on resources, but, but I hope that 
um, certainly members and parishes might recognise the improvements to the process that we have sought to bring forward. And as, as uh, Councillor Hawkins rightly highlights, we are keeping that matter under review. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, Councillor Khan, did you wish to come back on that? No, no, that was very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Councillor Chung Johnson. Hi, um, I have a couple of uh, points, if I may. Uh, one, um, one of my parish councils has complained about the availability of the website um, for planning, um, so that they've had experiences of wanting to review the documentation in preparation for their own planning committees and being unable to access documents or unable to access the website itself. Um, so are you, I obviously didn't see this in the report, but are you tracking the availability of the website um, uh, and uh, are we able to proactively inform parish councils where we know that there are issues with the website or if they're down for maintenance that they understand um, that it isn't available and therefore have the time to preemptively go in and, and look at those documents beforehand if they know if, if, if that downtime clashes with with when they need to prepare for a planning committee it's question one um, question two um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, as one of the strategic sites of the members of the strategic sites that um, the North Stowe planning um, officers have been excellent uh, and it's been obviously a difficult year for everybody with COVID um, but I think that our combination of moving the virtual forum at uh, the forums with the community online uh, and the responsiveness of your planning officers has really helped to uh, Kind of augment our reputation in planning uh, for North Stowe. So thank you uh, for that and thank you your team for that. Um, but we are also just about to lose our fourth planning officer for North Stowe and get a fifth one for phase one um, and, and that's fourth in the two years I've been uh, elected. Um, so and, and uh, we've lost the last three because they're contractors and obviously what happens is that they lose that they lose both the continuity of understanding what are the issues with North Stowe, but the community also loses that connectivity with understanding who the planning officers are and who they can reach out to as well as the parish councillors. Um, so could we consider for strategic sites specifically um, to prioritise hiring staff that are, are there on a permanent basis and kind of build that bank of knowledge um, which better serves us as a council and also our residents? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, are you going to take this? Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> I will start off. Um, thank you for acknowledging the uh, the work that the team have been doing uh, on Nosto. Um, you know, it's it's always good to get positive feedback. In terms of uh, trying to make sure we have um, you know permanent staff, I think you know you, you've just hit the nail on the head. The issue is not just us in South Cams; it's a nationwide issue of finding very good high quality uh, planners um, and especially you know in an area like ours that is uh, you know not the cheapest place in the on the planet to live uh, but rest assured we are continuing to look uh, you know for these planners and what we didn't want to do was leave those uh, you know the, the vacancies empty we wanted to make sure that work was going on we have to keep going we can't slow down um, and, you know, we've been able to fill, backfill with uh, with contract staff, but definitely we are looking uh, for for permanent staff. And I think you will see from um, uh, the page of page 21, you know, where we have, uh, you know, we give you a list of uh, vacancies that we have in the strategic sites. Um, yes, there's a number of them, but we're looking to fill them and we're trying to do this as quickly as we possibly can. Um, in terms of availability of the website, yes, there are times when it goes down for maintenance and we do put up on the on the main Southcams website itself when it will be available and when not. But we do recognise that there are times when due to server issues, you know, the site does go down <laughs> when we're not expecting it to. And at those times, it's not always easy to get the word out that, you know, something has gone wrong or it's gone down. Sometimes, you know, it's it's a it's a short period of time. I know we had an outage um, that sort of went on longer than it should have done over the weekend this time round. It was done for maintenance, but didn't come back up until, um, you know, the morning of uh, late morning of Monday. Again, that was due to it was unexpected. Um, 
And as soon as um, you know, we realized that that was what was going on, we got hold of my city were based in Hunton and not forgetting this is a three seas service. So in some ways it is out of our hands. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we've had actually in terms of keeping the site up. Um, we have uh, a thing as well, notification that we send to parish councils anyway, and uh, we can make sure that when sites are, the site is going to go down for maintenance, yes, they can be notified, but when unexpected happens, it's more difficult to do so. Thank you very much. Councillor John Johnson, are you wish to come back or are you content? No, thank you very much for those answers, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted, I've got a few points, but I just wanted to, to start off by saying the one thing I think that I think members and parish councillors I know found very useful is the, the, the weekly updates that are now um, being sent. They, they are, they're extremely welcome and I know my parishes are very grateful for them. So um, so thank you for that. That, that. That's a really good and useful um, thing to have done. Um, I did want to go back to this question about extensions and Councillor Cohn's questions. I, I caveat slightly that um, I'm afraid my, my internet broke up um, whilst the answers were coming to Councillor Cohn, so I apologise if you've already um, addressed some of these points. Um, but um, one one thing that, that does strike me is an important thing that would be useful for us to know is when an extension was requested. Was it after the original determination date? That, that seems to me to be an important point and it would be very useful if we could have that data in addition to the data on the percentage of, of, of cases where there is an extension. Um, and my second point on that was, um, I take the point that was raised earlier that extensions are used across LPAs, um, but it would be useful to know if our use of extensions is unusual or has been unusual at any point across other LPAs. So can we have some comparators um, against which to measure our, pro, our, our performance? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think this is quite a, um, uh, uh, a more operational issue, which I will ask uh, Sharon perhaps to um, explain, please. Sharon, over to you. I think Stephen Kelly is going to deal with this okay. question, Chair. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Obviously, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, obviously, all members of this committee have had a, a letter or a report from the Fuse Lane Consortium on this very point. Um, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, we certainly um, uh, have followed the way in which uh, the local authorities uh, approach, uh, I think, the issue of extensions of time, and we're not unusual dealing with that point first, first of all. So if you want to have live information on, on that across all 367 local planning authorities. You can actually look online um, and I can, uh, I can uh, unfortunately I've got another machine, I could post the web link. Um, but typically there is a difference between majors and minors in this regard. So um, if you, I will try and circulate a link to the uh, district planning authority performance tables which show this. But if I give you a, a couple of examples, so on major applications, which is decisions within 13 weeks, in fact, uh, across the country, the, 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 a very large proportion of those are in fact subject to extensions of time um, uh, through their processes. So um, uh, let me just see if I can find um, some of uh, uh, something that might be recognisable. Uh, but uh, you know they can be up to 75% or so because, as Sharon's highlighted earlier on, the, the aspiration, um, what we are trying to do here is deliver sustainable development. Uh, it's not in our interest to refuse everything, get another planning application in for which there is no fee, uh, and go round the houses again and again uh, in that process. Uh, but um, uh, there are, so if I look at, um, uh, so I'm just looking at some tables at the moment. If I look at uh, Newark and Sherwood, sorry, because this is just one that I can put a line on, um, of 119 major decisions, uh, 60 of them had extensions of time, so approximately 50%. Um, I was looking at South, uh, I was looking at Cornwall, which is a very large uh, singular planning service. It had 422 major decisions. Uh, 300 of those were subject to extensions of time. 
Uh, and uh, and so um, for major applications, there is quite a large uh, use of extensions of time to deliver, as, as Sharon's highlighted earlier, the welcome application, for example, it would be perverse to try and deal with that in 13 weeks. When it comes to minors and other categories of development, um, uh, the, the use of extensions of time is probably more variable and depends upon sets of circumstances. Uh, as the um, response uh, that I sent out earlier in the week, but in fact, as the report makes clear, you know, the, the, the discussion around planning decisions is increasingly a discussion with architects and agents uh, around um, the outcome with the objective of being to help our residents who make planning applications actually achieve a successful grant of consent so they can realise their project that's in an acceptable way rather than merely refuse them for the sake of good statistics. Uh, and so uh, although we have made efforts to try and work with local agents to reduce that figure um, in terms of the number of ex extensions of time, uh, there are, uh, and because we have had difficulties in terms of validation uh, backlogs that uh, the report has highlighted, uh, we have seen extensions of time um, increase over the last 12 months, I suspect. I haven't got a figure for you, um, Councillor Williams, that I can give you tonight. Um, and um, uh, but that is in response to the to the engagement that we've been having with agents in which they have said that, that particularly if there are delays, then indeed to get a quicker decision that is just means they have to start the process all over again. Uh, and that seems a very reductive process, uh, particularly if uh, unfortunately our current people have had to wait a bit longer to get the ball rolling. Um, in terms of when the extension of time is sought, um, uh, I suppose this, as Sharon's highlighted, we don't currently have that uh, detailed data in terms of uh, when it is sought. What we do have is when information was uh, confirmed in writing and the subject of the emails that you've had this week is to question whether or not that um, use of extension of time uh, in writing after the expiry of an application is appropriate or not. Um, and it's fair to say the uh, authorities are very mixed on this uh, in terms of there is no definitive position of whether it's right or wrong. Uh, we are nevertheless uh, exploring the conversation um, uh, with uh, on the point and, and certainly I'm happy to position for you at the next meeting, partly because uh, I could bore you with what Table 151A uh, uh, tab annex footnote 2 says, and indeed what the guidance published yesterday, footnote 10 of page 7 says, but it is uh, literally playing around with words of could and should and the absence of must that um, Richard will appreciate is quite a fine point as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, indeed, you know, I think we probably need to set that out more clearly because there is there is clearly um, local dialogue or, or exchanges on this point uh, and it probably is difficult to, to express it um, in detail at this, at this committee without a report uh, on the point. So I'm happy to bring something back in that regard together with um, uh, uh, the perhaps what clarity we can provide in terms of a breakdown of the extension of time figures for minors, which I think is what Councillor Williams is asking for. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I hope, hope um, uh, it offers clarity. I think I'm muted, Chair. Sorry, indeed I am. Did you wish to come back? Uh, no, just to say thank you for the offer to come back with a more detailed report. I'm sorry, my internet was breaking up again, but I think there was a, an offer to come back. So thank you, that'd be very useful. Thank you very much. Uh, next, it's Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I'm looking at Appendix D on page 21. And thank you very much for the breakdown of uh, the staff in the various teams. And I appreciate the work that you've done to, as it were, redistribute the work as you've melded the two teams together. Um, and I just wondered, um, I know uh, that we do um, you know, with all the development going on in South Cambridgeshire, this should be a very exciting um, and uh, council to work for because there's so much work going on here. 
Um, and But inevitably, people will leave for one reason or another. And I just wondered, I know we do exit interviews for our own staff, but I just wanted to check that we are doing exit interviews for the agency staff as well, because these are people who will have worked with different authorities and different bodies. And so it might be very useful to hear from them their views too, and to make sure that we're learning from those. Um, that might probably be more more appropriately directed actually to um, Sharon Brown or Stephen Kelly, perhaps. Uh, it's uh, I'll leave you to decide. Well, should we give Councillor Hawkins the opportunity yes, to <laughs> answer? And if she decides that she wished to pass it on, then she may do so. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Brunham is right. You know, we do do um, exit uh, interviews for our staff. I think I mentioned earlier that I wasn't sure if we did it uh, for contract staff. So I will ask Sharon if you can confirm that or not at this point in time. Thank you. Sharon, please. Yes, Chair. We have recently put in place a new process for exit interviews. So now we have a designated uh, officer within the service, within our business operations team, who carries out all the exit interviews. And she carries out exit interviews in relation to both permanent and agency staff. Um, having single officer gives us consistency um, in terms of the way those exit interviews are carried out and also ensures that we get the right information in terms of that feedback and um, identification of themes that are coming out of those exit interviews. Thank you very much. Councillor Radnam, are you content with that? Uh, I'm very reassured. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad that we're making use of that information. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor De Lacey. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, can I start by pointing out that I didn't get a chance to abstain on the minutes, but as I wasn't there, um, I hope that the current minute won't say it was unanimous approval because it wasn't quite. Um, I, I've got three concerns. Uh, and they're all sort of related. Um, the first one is on feedback. We've got a lot of new systems. Um, they don't all work perfectly. I've given some feedback on both the weekly report, which is great, but has problems, and on iDocs, which works, but has problems. And my feedback just seems to go into a, a, a black hole and I don't know whether I'm just wasting my time. It would be very nice to have some response to feedback and, and to see the problems solved. So that's my first concern. IDOCS, I think, has one big problem, uh, which uh, Councillor Chung Johnson has uh, indirectly referred to. I think it is the case that you cannot um, go straight to the planning application bit that you want that for some reason IDOCS insists that you go through a front door. And so we do get often uh, these responses that uh, the document you want is not available or you're not allowed to have that document or something like that. Um, and that is a huge problem when a parish council is trying to look at, say, one document which is very important uh, for deciding a, um, a parish council's response to a particular application. So I, I hope that that will be sorted out. Um, when there is uh, expected downtime for IDOCs, I think just putting a notice on the main website is not really helpful. Um, people need to know in advance, and I, I would have thought it easy to develop a simple matter of programming, as programmers say, uh, an automated way of at least getting members and parish clerks information that the planning website will not be available between these dates. Uh, and I hope you will consider that as a matter of urgency because it has become such a key issue, especially now there aren't paper uh, uh, plans that we can look at in the parish office, if only we could get to a parish office anyway. Um, it is key that we know when uh, IDOCS is not going to be available. Um, finally, Stephen mentioned Mr Fulton uh, and he circulated his response to Mr Fulton. Mr Fulton has uh, circulated his own response to that response. It clearly doesn't satisfy him. And he said at the end of his own uh, response to the response, the proper course of action for the council would be to voluntarily undertake an audit of the planning performance returns in question. Um, 
split infinitives aside, this seems to be the only part of this agenda in which we can uh, think whether this committee is the right uh, organisation to take that forward in the council, because Mr Fulton is clearly not satisfied with the way that we're dealing with him at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, did you wish to start? Uh, yes, Chair, I will. Um, thank you, Councillor De Lacey. Uh, we always do appreciate feedback and I'm um, sorry that you feel that some of the feedback that you have given has gone into a black hole. Uh, that is definitely not our intention. Um, but if uh, we can come back to you outside of the meeting, to, you know, um, I will personally come back to you, please, if you don't mind. Um, so that I can find out which ones it is you have sent and um, make sure that we get that if it's not already in the system to be dealt with that it is. We do have somebody whose job it is, um, you know, to actually look after our, um, you know, the, the, the IDOC system. So we'll make sure that that gets fed in. Um, and also I will say to members, if, if there's any specific sort of keystrokes or attempts that you're making that is that you find that you know, you can't access the document. It's useful for us to know so that those sets of keystrokes can be followed and tested. Um, I know people are, you know, approach the site differently, but it does help if we can narrow down how people access it to then find out what the problem might be so, so we can find the solution to it. Um, automated notification, that's definitely something that we can look into. Um, I will defer to Sharon to tell me if that is something that we can do. I know that IDOCS has a lot of functions that you know, enable it to be the, the planning software that is planning software of choice in the country. So there must be something we can do about that, definitely. Um, as to uh, the last one about the, uh, the response to the response um, of Mr. Fulton not being satisfied, I think um, perhaps I should defer this to Stephen to answer since he's been the one in communication with Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Toomey. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Toomey. And 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 just uh, uh, Chairman. You're with, 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 sorry. Um, I'll turn my camera off just in, in case. Um, uh, hopefully that's a bit better. Uh, we are intending to do some uh, training with parishes to, to help us to understand how we can help uh, picking up on, on Councillor de Lacey's point, um, uh, everyone to use the system uh, in the best possible way and indeed how we can finesse the system. So that is something that will come in the in the new year and I, and, uh, I am sorry about um, the perception that things aren't changing. Um, in terms of, um, uh, and we will look at this automated notification, in terms of the, the, the point about Mr or the Fuse Lane Consortium's request for an audit, um, uh, what I would say is at this moment in time, uh, we are in a position where effectively we are exploring uh, a, and a dialogue around the criteria that are used, not the information on the, and the data. Um, and uh, as I said earlier on, uh, there are some fine points of definition here in terms of the different sources for determining performance data, um, which I would prefer and I think the right approach because I don't think it's a question of um, the uh, absolute performance, it's a question of the interpretation of the national performance process. Um, now that process we have followed, we have not changed. So the way that we approach extensions of time and the determination of applications either inside or outside of time has not changed. So the relative performance of the service, I think, is uh, something that you can note. Uh, uh, rather, um, uh, particularly the uh, improvement in the ability to manage it. But in terms of the point that is being raised by the Fuse Lane Consortium, that the council is relying on the wrong interpretation, the, uh, unfortunately, it's fair to say that sources are mixed in terms of where do you go to define this? And that is why I said earlier on, I think it's important for us to be able to come back and clarify that point because once uh, you have, but once we're able to clarify that point, there is then a question about: Do you want to look at the uh, 
um, uh, 7,000 or so applications for uh, the dates that go to things like extensions of time. The moment the uh, expiration is around the way in which the council is interpreting the government's requirements for reporting performance, and that is, um, uh, as I said, the, the subject of uh, a dependency on which source you go to, which is not clear. And we are seeking advice from the planning advisory service on this matter. Uh, and it seems to me before uh, anything else, it would be appropriate to um, report back to this committee on the outcome of that before you consider then going back to look at 7000 cases or so that have been determined. So that would be my advice to you. Uh, and um, uh, as you have seen, the correspondence has only just emerged in the last few days. We have sought to respond to that. Uh, and um, we expect, uh, I would expect to be able to respond uh, as an answer to Councillor Richard Williams's question, within a sense, um, a more comprehensive report on the point rather than on the figures, because the figures in a sense arise from interpretation. Uh, so uh, you know, it's, a, it's a matter for the committee, um, but I think the, the starting point needs to be an understanding of what it is, uh, is, is the definition of the performance, and that's where the current disagreement with uh, the Fuse Lane Consortium exists. Thank you. Councillor De Lacey, did you wish to come back? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, that, that's all tremendously helpful. Um, I, I think we should just note, though, that uh, Mr Fulton has appealed to this committee and uh, for better or for worse, I think this committee does need uh, somehow to handle his concerns, maybe as, as Stephen has said, uh, via a report from Stephen to the committee uh, on which we can say, yes, we are satisfied. But at the moment, um, it, it seems to me we, we need some sort of closure. Indeed, and, and can I just add that um, as part B of the recommendations that we have, we are being asked to support the establishment of a joint member office of planning improvement group on a task and finish basis. Um, and the one of the officers engaged in that would be following conversations with between Liz Watts and the conversation that I've had with the leader this afternoon would be Jeff Membry, who uh, would be part of the internal audit team. So and that will be as we will speak shortly if we agree to set that up that will be a, a fairly rapid task and finish operation uh, designed to report in February. That's very helpful. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Daunton. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like us just to look um, at page 21, um, the technical support team. Um, could you just uh, give us some more information about the vacancies there? I know that um, in respect to planning officers, it's very difficult to recruit planning officers and we do accept that and that's a nationwide difficulty. But um, technical support team officers, are, it, it's quite a different job as, as I understand it. Um, and I just wondered we just would like to have reflections on why you think there's uh, so many vacant posts there um, and what's being done in terms of recruitment. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as I'm not that close to the recruitment process, I will ask Sharon to uh, answer that question, please. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Chair. So the reason for the number of vacancies is we do have agency staff that are held against those vacant posts and the vacant posts that we have are fixed term posts. So they under the, um, the shared service, the original shared service report, the implementation report, uh, a number of fixed term posts were due to expire in March 2021. So what we've done is it got nearer to the March 2021 date rather than filling those posts because obviously they would expire in March. Um, we um, we filled those with agency staff so that um, obviously the, because that makes it more flexible use. So um, we do have our permanent posts are, are all filled. I can assure Councillor Dawson. 
OK, thank you, Sharon. Um, Chairman, might I just ask a, su a supplementary on that? Um, mm -hmm. And so these these technical support teams work across the shared service um, and are basically doing the same work across the shared service. Uh, yes, that is correct. Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. No, that that means that we have streamlined that part of the service to one process, so they work across both okay. councils. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Ian Solomon. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, just on page six and seven under paragraph 14, there's some discussion of the the much improved performance and reference to to Appendix A, and it is it is you know, fantastic to see and well done. I just uh, one of the it, there's obviously a discussion of extensions in there and some other reasons, but I, I, there's no mention at all of volume of applications and I just I, I'm, uh, just curious as to, to whether there's been any sort of change in overall volume of, of applications on any of these types. And also just as a as a as a stretch, maybe given that the improvement in performance that we've seen, would we would the planning service be considering raising some of these targets for next year or? Well, that's, a, that's a challenge answering that one. Councillor Hawkins. <laughs> uh, thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Solom. Uh, we, are, we are measuring ourselves by the national, nationally defined targets. Um, so I will be happy for us to carry on doing that. And when we have comfortably um, you know, done that to our heart's content, perhaps we can consider, um, you know, increase in the target but yeah give us some time and I'm sure we will get we will get there. Um, in terms of uh, application numbers uh, what we noticed was that obviously with COVID we had a drop um, in application numbers and um, some of it has since come back but especially the householders is where the numbers have come back up. Obviously people were holding things back not sure when they could start work or you know if they could do anything. And we're happy to see that come back. Um, but we've also had uh, a drop in major applications, I think because we had quite a number coming from the city as part of the joint service, but that has reduced. <laughs> OK, so but generally application numbers have come back up to what they were uh, pre COVID. Some of the losses we have incurred in the meantime, we will be able to get some of the uh, some of that loss back from uh, government uh, promising that they will give us, I don't know, I think it's about 75% of the losses that they would cover. Um, but yes, you know, in terms of workload, it is still high uh, for uh, for our, um, uh, our officers because the number of them were, I think, um, juggling about 100 case, cases at some point during the last few months, and that's a lot for um, one officer to deal with. Grenville, you were on mute, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. I should practice what I preach, shouldn't I? <laughs> what, one more question from Councillor Bradnam and then we move on. Councillor Bradnam, you're mute. <laughs> um, and I've probably forgotten the question I wanted to ask, so I shall leave it. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Um, well, I have no more speakers, so uh, I suggest that we move now to the recommendations which are uh, noted in paragraph seven on page four. And they are firstly that we note the content of this report and secondly that we support the establishment of a joint member office of planning improvement group on a task and finish model to oversee the implementation of the planning advisory service recommendations arising from its planning committee review report. Now, um, this I have spoken to the leader this afternoon and we would, assuming that we proceed with this, uh, aim to have a very high intensity task and finish group working in January with the intention of bringing a report back, uh, taking a report to Cabinet as soon as we can. 
Um, so this is obviously going to be a significant amount of work. So once we've agreed it, I would like them uh, to look for volunteers. And I see Councillor Bradnam has got a question on the before we take the recommendation. Yes, uh, Chairman, that's exactly what I wanted to check. Uh, the, uh, the the two things, one which you've covered, which is the time commitment for it, um, but also um, given that a task and finish group normally works quite quickly, but actually some of the outworkings of what uh, the, the improvements that are working through might take some time to work through. And I was just wondering, does the time scale of a task and finish work with the job it's being tasked to do? I, I absolutely appreciate it. it's useful to pick it up. Um, these initial um, targets, as it were, but I just wondered, is that going to work if we need to follow long term? I believe that everyone's minds who take part will be focused in doing exactly that. So uh, it will have high intensity and it will carry the support of, uh, of the entire council. Is anyone opposed to the recommendations which are set out in paragraph seven? I'm seeing no responses, so thank you very much to uh, to you, Councillor Hawkins, to Sharon and to Stephen. Your answers this evening have been extremely comprehensive and I think it's uh, significantly demonstrated by the fact that uh, councillors have almost entirely been satisfied with your responses. So well done to you all. Thank you very much. You may wish you may stay if you wish, but if not, may I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Chair, on behalf of uh, Sharon and Stephen and the entire uh, planning team. We wish you all a happy Christmas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent report. Uh, can we move on then to item seven on the agenda, which is the work programme? Uh, you have a copy of it in front of you. Uh, it goes with Chairman. the... Sorry. Sorry, uh, did, you, did you want to look then at volunteers for that? Oh yes, I did. I'm, I do. I do apologise. Um, I'm really looking for, sorry, thank you for the reminder. Okay. I'm really looking for uh, three members uh, to serve on this task and finish group. Uh, and I've already got one, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much. Um, it will be high intensity. My, my expectation would be that it will start very early in January and perhaps at least one meeting a week for four weeks of that sort of order to complete the tasks. So it will be high intensity and high commitment. So if I could have volunteers, I would be extremely grateful. <laughs> There's always a but. <laughs> I'd like to be part of it, Grenville, because um, on the planning committee, you know, I think I have an insight, but uh, uh, so, but I am slightly anxious about the workload involved. Well, if you would take it on, Richard would take it on, then I will make up the third if there are no other volunteers. It looks as though <coughs> there are no other volunteers. So that's the three of us. We'll okay. try and uh, work it between us. Thank you very much both of you for volunteering. So we go to the, uh, the work programme. Uh, the health warning of course that I gave last night is that uh, January does look uh, to be a heavy programme. I'm not sure that we can uh, whittle it down much but we will, the Vice Chairman and I will talk uh, as we get a little closer to the date. Uh, of course, there is a possibility that some of these reports may slip, um, but they can't slip too far. A lot of it, of course, is, is budget related, uh, so there's not much scope for that to slip. 
um, and February is starting now to look a little bit heavier too, as we were likely to have uh, perhaps the report of three task and finish groups. Uh, Sarah's anti-racism task and finish group, the COVID-19 response task and finish group, and the planning of planning improvement task and finish group. So um, I suspect that you may wish to plan in January to have either a very early dinner or a very late one. <laughs> the next day. <laughs> uh, or possibly. For a while. Did anyone else? No, Chairman, he may also want to book a holiday, perhaps. Mm. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a good idea. Um, if everyone is, is content with that, then can we move on to item eight on the agenda? Um, you have Ch the... Chair, may I interrupt you just a second? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, Peter, Peter just mentioned he lost sound for a while and he says he's the only one. Can, can, would, you, would you mind just checking, making sure everybody can, can hear? I didn't lose any sound. No, I didn't either. Is everyone else OK? I think it's just you, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> it's that scarf covering your ears. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, item Chairman, 80, did, sorry. sorry, just to say that did Peter was Peter? Did Peter lose sound when we were discussing the task and finish group? Uh, did you miss the opportunity to volunteer, Peter? Uh, Chairman, I think I'm quite happy to have missed that. Um, <laughs> it was entirely fortuitous that my sound went at that moment. <laughs> Funnily enough, I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> um, so we come to the uh, the task and finish group um, document on agenda item eight, and you will see that um, that we have proposed a draft terms of reference, but thanks to uh, the comment made by Councillor Solon last night. Under point three, you will note that we have uh, proposed to uh, support residents over the winter months. I think it perhaps might be better uh, to extend that through to early summer, which will give us time to um, probably start a second task and finish group once this one is complete. Uh, to look at the longer term. So my view is that this particular task and finish group that we're dealing with now should look at the medium short at the immediate short term and then we take a little bit longer to look at the wider aspects of supporting um, those vulnerable and lonely people within our communities uh, for a longer term um, solution. Is everyone content with that one? Joe, you've got a question. Chair, it's it's more of a, a point rather than a, a question, if I may. Okay. Yeah, uh, go, a government announced today that they were extending the furlough scheme till the back end of April. Yes. So yeah, I, I, I guess that probably government and the experts are probably thinking that we are obviously not quite out of the woods as yet. Yeah. So I think probably anything that we do in, in, from Ian's point of view and his suggestion and this, this committee is that if we can extend it further out in time, that possibly will be of great benefit. Thank you. Is everyone happy to just extend that perhaps through, uh, let's say yeah. until June 2021, and then we'll look at the, uh, at the, the further task and finish group subsequently to look in the longer term. Yeah, um, I, I can say we've had two um, really, really good meetings so far. And I have to say the input from officers Jay Clark and Cecilia Murphy Rhodes has been extraordinary. Uh, they've been incredibly helpful, extremely well motivated um, and have given us some really good um, information. Um, Cecilia is presently putting together a news uh, information sheet which will go out to all the voluntary groups this side of Christmas. Um, Jay is, and she are planning uh, to provide over 800 meals to um, vulnerable people on the 23rd of December 
with the compliments of the council, which I think is a massive task. And they really are to be uh, credited for excellent work that they, they have done and are doing. Uh, and I am hopeful that we will come out with some uh, some very useful responses. We, we're presently waiting for results of a survey which has gone out to all the parishes within the district seeking um, indications of what facilities that they, they have, what are open, what are closed, um, what those facilities have been used for. Uh, there's been 36 responses so far, but um, there are obviously a lot more to come. And so we pause now until after Christmas when we will reconvene and look at uh, really trying to identify the um, best course of action. So uh, my thanks so far to the work that you've done to Claire, to Joe, and to uh, Judith, who can't be with us this evening. But thank you for what you've done, but it's nothing compared to what you're going to do in the future. Joe, so you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, you may not have seen this actually, uh, Grenville. Um, Cecilia sent an email out at 20, 24 past four. Uh, the winter warmer, a collection of ideas. This is the initial stab at this newsletter. Okay. It, it is Im impressive. Yeah. It really is. Um, I think I, I can't add to what you said. That the, the, they are superb. Mm -hmm. It's got interactive uh, video for, for help. It's, it's got everything. So and it covers a vast uh, array of, of potential help. So this is, is a, as well as going to support groups, uh, this will be for loved ones looking for help for loved ones as well. So it's, it's, it's a stonker. Have a look at it at leisure this, oh, yeah. this evening over a glass of port. It'll be a red one, I think. Um, I, uh, Liz Watts is with us. I'll, I'll ask Liz to pass on our thanks. I think they've done a sterling job, I really do. Is everyone content with the uh, with the scrutiny COVID-19 response? Uh, taking note of, of the report and uh, agreeing yes. to the amendment. Yes. Thank you Thank for the you. work, the people who the, the work that people have done. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure working with uh, two young people who are so committed and dedicated. It is an absolute delight. Thank so, you, Chair. <laughs> there, there are, of course, there is always a but, <laughs> um, So, members, can I just remind you that the uh, date of the next meeting is Tuesday, the 19th of January at 5.20 p.m. Does anyone have any further questions? I'd just like to thank you, Granville, for chairing You've been, and, and for the good humour, and also to thank Victoria for all her work. I, I was I was coming to that because um, there's no doubt that we could do half of what we do without the talented Victoria, who is. Um, it, it, although I have to, I must tell you because not everyone will know this. Uh, Joe Joe did complain the other day because or yesterday uh, because Victoria was late with the reported notes. Uh, we left the meeting at 3.15, Joe expected them at 3.30 and they did not arrive until four o'clock. Uh, absolutely outrageous to complain. We've had outstanding service from Victoria hey, and tremendous, tremendous support from Liz as well. So um, to both of you, thank you so much for all your contributions. But to you, the members, you've made this all possible. Uh, and I would like to wish you and your families a very, very Merry Christmas and a very happy and safe New Year. And, and I look forward to seeing you all in January because I, I think this is probably my last council meeting before Christmas. <laughs> and after yesterday's JDCC, I'm absolutely thrilled to say that. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> all the very Thank best to you all. Thanks, 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 Thanks,